Assalamu alaikum students, welcome back to class. Um, this is your American literature class and um, I am going, just going to recap what we have done in the last few lectures. We are nearing the end of our semester and um, we are currently doing uh, a play by Tennessee Williams, um, the famous contemporary American playwright. Before this, I have introduced you to essays, short stories, um, novels, and poetry. And my attempt throughout has been to give you um, as comprehensive an introduction to American literature as it is possible in this short time. Um, the semester is always a short one when you want to do a lot. Um, and I have tried to introduce you to the different genres um, in literature. So now that we have covered um, short stories and um, essays, uh, novel and poetry, uh, we're doing a play. And if we still have time left after we finish the glass menagerie, I'd like to do uh, one uh, essay and one short story more. But we'll see that um, when we come to that point in time. So this essay has been written by Tennessee Williams. And um, I'm sure uh, by now you are familiar with the name. He is one of the most famous um, of contemporary American playwrights and he has um, written a lot. He, uh, and it's not only um, plays that he has written, he's also written short stories. And some of his plays, in fact, are based on short stories um, that were very successful and um, for which uh, Williams felt that um, the plot could be adapted to a play. So um, we are at uh, a point in time where um, Williams discusses um, relationships, essentially speaking, and relationships within a small family. The family comprises of um, the Wingfields, uh, and that is uh, Amanda Wingfield, um, her son um, Tom Wingfield, and her daughter Laura Wingfield. Um, there is also a fourth character in the play, although he makes an appearance right at the end, and he's not really a family member. This um, a person or this character is only introduced as a gentleman caller. And I'm going to explain to you in a minute what exactly a gentleman caller is so that you have this fresh in your mind um, when you are um, studying the text. The fifth character, although he doesn't make a physical appearance, is Mr. Wingfield. I say that he doesn't make an appearance uh, and yet is a character in the play because um, throughout the play uh, what we see is a portrait of Mr. Wingfield on one of the walls of the set. Now the set is designed in such a way that we are able to see a number of places. And then um, Tennessee Williams has uh, designed a stage set that allows us to see into a number of rooms. Um, he has this uh, prop that is actually a screen. And this screen sometimes hides certain characters or certain um, rooms or places. And at other moments, it acts to reveal something that is bound to happen, something that is at the back of the character's mind, um, etc., etc. And there's a big legend on the screen. So when the play starts, we see um, the, uh, the Wingfield apartment, which is um, not in a posh neighborhood. Far from it, it's actually one of the lower middle class uh, buildings. And um, it is characterized not only by the interior, but also by the exterior of the building. You know, um, these are um, buildings that are like boxes. And um, there's a side of the box um, that is pleasant to look at, and that is the front. 
and there's a side of the box that is not pleasant to look at um, and where you find dirt and squalor and filth and that is the rear of the building obviously the apartments in the front of the building and those that have a good view are more expensive um, whereas the apartments in the rear uh, are uh, cheap so in the same building you would have expensive apartments and you would have a cheaper version um, and uh, one other thing I want to point out about these cheaper apartments uh, of which the Wingfield apartment is one um, is the fact that um, their entrances are not from um, the foyer or the lobby of the main building um, their entrances are through the fire escapes you know according to um, American law every building um, especially multi-story building must have a fire escape and um, those fire escapes are usually at the rear of the building so that they don't spoil the view of the building um, but since it is an essential part of a building so you have the fire escapes and then with the fire escapes you have these buildings um, these um, apartments very small apartments um, and obviously very cheap so um, Tom Wingfield comes dressed as a narrator as um, a merchant sailor uh, and yet he's also one of the characters in the play so the point at which I left you uh, was where Amanda her son and her daughter are um, are eating and uh, one of the instructions that Williams gives at the very end at the very beginning of the play is that this play is a memory play and as such it doesn't have to be realistic because um, as um, you perhaps um, will have noticed that uh, when we exercise our memory when we go back into things um, that we remember we remember what we want to remember so our memory is selective it doesn't have to be realistic so the glass menagerie because it is a memory play it doesn't have anything to do with reality that's not to say that it's a story of imagination but it doesn't have to stick to facts so with Tom making an entrance um, when his mother calls out to him and says we can't say grace at the table unless and until you are here Tom who is so far uh, played the part of a narrator standing on the fire escape landing makes his entrance into the main play and so they all sit at the table where Tom makes motions of eating there's no food on the table there are no utensils but because Williams wants to show a scene in which all three are eating so they make motions you know like um, picking up a cup and um, try, uh, attempting to drink tea or um, taking a knife and fork uh, imaginary knife and fork and wielding it as if you are eating so you make motions of eating but you're not actually doing it because there are no um, plates or um, uh, forks and knives or glasses or anything like that um, what you do see is a table the table is there but there's nothing on the table except for uh, perhaps a tablecloth so the point at which I left you in the last class was where um, Mrs. Wingfield <coughs> tells Tom in a slightly you know scolding tone not to push his food around uh, and um, to use uh, bread when he wants to eat so taking up that um, discussion uh, William says animals have sections in their stomachs which enable them to digest food without mastication but human beings are supposed to chew their food before they swallow it down so she's making a reference to the way that Tom is eating she doesn't like um, the way he eats and so she says don't swallow your food don't gobble up everything but chew and chew 
number of times. You know, um, dentists say that you should chew your food 32 times. Of course, it's difficult. You know, you go like difficult to do and of course funny to look at I'm sure I look very funny doing that um, anyway so um, that is what dentists say uh, and that's the kind of thing that Mrs. Wingfield is trying to explain to uh, her son because he just makes the motion of eating and then he gets up and goes um, so eat she says eat food leisurely son and really enjoy it a well-cooked meal has lots of delicate flavors that have to be held in the mouth for appreciation so chew your food and give your salivary glands a chance to function now you don't want to have this kind of a conversation at the table you know you if you're eating you want to enjoy your food you don't want to concentrate on what is happening to your interior how your digestion is working uh, or not working so what Tom does is um, he's been sitting at the table and he lays his imaginary fork down and he pushes his chair back and he says I haven't enjoyed one bite of this dinner because of your constant directions on how to eat it. It's you that makes me rush through meals with your hawk-like attention to every bite I take. Sickening, spoils my appetite, all this discussion of animal secretion, salivary glands, mastication. So Tom gets very angry and he says, I don't want to hear these things at the table. I can't enjoy my food you're always at me saying chew your food this is what happens uh, in the digestion system um, this is how animals eat he doesn't like it and you know he's grown up he's not a little baby anymore um, who has to be explained all these things so he gets very angry and of course his mother um, doesn't take him seriously at all and um, she says temperament like a metrop metropolitan star you're not excused from the table so when Tom gets up um, it's a gesture that he wants to be excused from the table and this privilege Amanda takes from him when she says you are not excused that means you keep on sitting here I do not allow you to go away and Tom says I'm only getting a cigarette so Amanda um, is shown as the kind of mother who objects to everything that her children do she objects to everything that people around her say she would like to have the entire um, scenario changed uh, but she can't do it because she's poor because she doesn't have resources and because her husband has left her um, as Tom the narrator points out in the very beginning of the play um, his father was a man who fell in love with long distance um, and one fine day he just disappeared from the house without inform informing anyone without asking anyone um, as to what he planned to do so when Tom um, says he's getting uh, a cigarette and Amanda says you smoke too much um, he gets very angry and um, he um, goes out of um, the dining room and Amanda says uh, because you know she's always objecting to whatever he says she would like him um, to spend a lot of time at home she would like him to make a lot of money uh, but um, since um, none of these things can happen she just takes out her anger and her frustration uh, on Tom because um, she holds him responsible now he's the man in the house so she says um, temperament like a metropolitan star um, you're not excused from the table and uh, you know um, she, um, she she doesn't like the fact that um, Tom is starting to have his own um, identity and he's starting to assert himself now that he's earning for himself and he is also um, supporting the family so um, when Laura sees this uh, very tense situation she also pushes back her chair and rises and she says I'll bring in the blancmange now the blancmange is um, the dessert 
and um, Tom sort of ignores Amanda totally uh, but Amanda when she hears Laura saying that she says no sister no sister you be the lady this time and I'll be the darky now this is again a reference to a situation which is not really true you know they um, they have hardly enough to eat they're not of the kind of um, people um, who can afford a servant and the fact that Amanda refers to a servant as a darky is again an example of um, the fact that Amanda is not living in the present she is living in the past she's still living um, in a time in which they had a lot of money her family was um, uh, was loaded as you would call it uh, these days um, they had a lot of money um, and uh, they enjoyed a, a good lifestyle now all that has gone but she still makes references um, to their life as if that same um, household or that same social situation exists so when she says uh, you be you play the lady now and um, I'll play the darky she is uh, in other words what she's saying is that this is the kind of work that a servant would do you don't do this work yourself so she's making a reference to a time when they still had um, African Americans as uh, servants um, and the fact that she refers to Laura as um, the lady again is an indication that she's not living in the present tense she's living at um, a point in time in the past the remote past and um, a time which is not really true so Laura says I'm already up I've already risen uh, and Amanda says resume your seat little sister I want you to stay fresh and pretty for gentlemen callers now if you remember I told you at the very beginning of um, the lesson today that I'm going to explain to you what a gentleman caller is I explained this term to you in the last class also but just to refresh your minds a gentleman caller um, would visit the house of an unmarried lady with the purpose of seeking her permission for marriage you know the kind that you have uh, for the rishta thing um, the equivalent that we have here is uh, when what we call a boy comes to a girl's house and um, and uh, proposes um, to marry someone of course in our society it's different we don't have just the boy coming along we have his whole family you know he'd have his mother his father his sisters maybe an an aunt and an uncle also uh, coming along and the whole family would visit but we're talking about contemporary American society not contemporary in fact since Amanda is talking about a time in the past let's say 30 years in the past so essentially speaking she is to her mind is stuck in um, somewhere in the 1920s uh, and whatever she refers to is from that period in time so um, she talks about ladies and she talks about servants although in the very beginning of the play we've been told um, that the Wingfield apartment is um, in a building uh, which is in the lower middle class district so that's enough to um, to give you an indication of the kind of um, social situation the Wingfields um, ex are experiencing at the moment when the play is um, is, is being um, conducted is being enacted so um, she says you resume your seat because you have to be fresh and pretty for gentlemen callers now <clears throat> for the thing with the gentlemen callers was that there was a time that was reserved um, in which um, young men who wanted to get married and who were not yet married or engaged would come to visit now this time was generally in the afternoon let's say between three and five um, and 
that was the time when they would all come to those houses and they would have tea uh, and they would have discussions so that they could sort of gauge what um, the prospective wife was like not just in terms of uh, appearance but also whether she could converse whether she would be a good addition to the family so the gentleman callers are those who would uh, be um, prospective suitors uh, who would one day want to marry you so the fact that Amanda refers to gentlemen callers uh, is ironic because there are no gentlemen callers and Laura very quickly says I'm not expecting any gentlemen callers um, because Laura knows her situation she knows herself um, she knows um, how poor they are uh, and she is also aware of the fact that they don't know many people so um, how would there be any gentlemen callers and uh, Amanda says oh sometimes they come when they are least expected why I remember one afternoon in Blue Mountain and you know um, she makes a reference to an occasion which she has done over and over again and uh, Tom says I know what's coming and Laura says yes but let her tell it and Tom says again and Laura says she loves to tell it now this is where you get an indication of the situation within the Wingfield household Mrs. Wingfield lives in the past she lives in a, t in a time when she was very young and beautiful um, and the member of a very uh, well-to-do family and um, she keeps on thinking of that time the place where she had her, her house or where her parents had their house was in the Blue Mountain and she keeps on referring to um, the Blue Mountain um, in order to draw the attention away from the present moment which is um, a very very small apartment at the rear of uh, a building which is in the lower middle class section of the city so um, nothing positive at all yet she makes constant uh, references to the Blue Mountain and she says you know there was one uh, Sunday afternoon when I had 17 gentlemen callers you have to remember that this is um, the time before you had the telephones uh, and before uh, you had such speedy communication so if anyone was going there to a certain place he would go there and there would be no way of confirming whether um, the host or the hostess was going to be there or not so um, when she says that one Sunday afternoon she had 17 gentlemen callers what she's trying to say is that she was so popular and so beautiful and so eligible that at one point in time 17 young men wanted to marry her uh, but like it happens with most families and I'm sure you've experienced it in your family also when parents start um, going uh, there's no knowing where they will stop and so they tell you one thing 10,000 times now um, a lot of um, the children these days say oh you've already told us this or oh we've heard this before tell us something new but um, we are talking about um, a time when this was considered rudeness early 20th century so when Tom says you know she's starting off on that again Laura says let her tell it you know she feels happy telling it because the reality is um, so much in contrast to what she imagines or what her life was like 30 35 years ago that um, she can't really live in the present the present is far too painful for her and that is one reason why she's living in the past and each time she retells the story she brings the past back to life again so um, Laura says um, you know let her tell it 
and Amanda starts off on her story. By this time, she's brought the bowl of dessert. <clears throat> and so she says, One Sunday afternoon in Blue Mountain, your mother received 17 gentlemen callers. Why, sometimes there weren't chairs enough to accommodate them all. We had to send the nigger over to bring in folding chairs from the parish house. So you remember that contempt in um, Amanda's voice. She now belongs to the lower middle class. But she still likes to pretend um, that she belongs to the very elite in society. And so um, her speech, the words she uses, the tone of voice that she uses um, reflects um, how she considers herself to be in the same position that she was 30-35 years ago. And so she refers to um, the black servant as a darky, as a nigger. Now, um, in uh, contemporary times, nigger is an insult, just as calling somebody a darky would be considered an insult. So she says, you know, there were so many people together wanting to marry me that we had to um, send our servant to the parish to get more chairs. There were so many people, we didn't even have um, sufficient chairs for them to be seated at one time. So um, Tom, although he's heard this story a number of times, he says, how did you entertain those gentlemen callers? Now he is being ironic, but Amanda doesn't see that coming. Amanda thinks um, Tom is genuinely um, interested. So just to sort of um, help her on, um, he says, how did you entertain those gentlemen callers? You know, having 17 men in the same afternoon, uh, what do you talk about? And she says, I understood the art of conversation. And Tom is being sarcastic and he says, I bet you could talk. Um, of course, Amanda um, misses the sarcasm totally and she says girls in those days knew how to talk I can tell you and Tom is still sarcastic um, because he knows that his mother loves to talk now one of the stage um, directions that um, Tennessee Williams gave in the very beginning um, was that there are going to be these screens on which you have the legend painted instead of the action showing you all of this you just have a one-liner and that explains a lot of things if you remember when Amanda uh, was first going to make an appearance, the legend said, where are the snows of yesteryear? And that showed you that Amanda lives in the past and um, she hankers for the past. She feels very nostalgic and she would like the past to come back again because in the past she was rich, she had a lot of people around her, she had a very um, hectic social life, none of which is true in the present moment. So um, when um, Amanda says that, you know, I had the art of entertainment and I could converse, um, Tom feels rather skeptical about it. Now the image that is projected onto the screen is that of Amanda as a girl on a porch greeting Caller. So she's like this gracious hostess uh, and she's standing at the top of the steps maybe or in the porch and there's this long line of um, visitors or of guests who have come with proposals um, of marriage uh, for Amanda. And Amanda says they knew how to entertain their German gentlemen callers and she's referring to girls. It wasn't enough for a girl to be possessed of a pretty face and a graceful figure, although I wasn't delighted in either 
respect she also needed to have a nimble wit and a tongue to meet all occasions so a girl needed to um, be able to converse with the gentleman callers not just sit there looking very pretty very prim and proper she needed to have conversation she needed to be able to talk with these uh, men and to keep them entertained because basically both sides were looking for marriage so while the girl would be assessing the different men in comparison with one another all those men would be looking at her and trying to gauge whether she would make a good wife um, a good supporting partner or not so um, Amanda Wingfield certainly knows how to talk and she says you know um, I could hold my own with any of the gentlemen callers although of course because this is Amanda's story none of the gentlemen callers um, was an ordinary young man young man they all had to be extraordinary and so when Tom says well what did you talk about Amanda says things of importance going on in the world never anything coarse or common or vulgar so things of importance going on in the world what possibly could they be talking about they'd be talking about fashion they'd be talking about parties because she belonged to um, that group in society for whom all of life was one big party and they were moving from one place to another enjoying themselves and with no responsibilities um, whatsoever so um, um, and, and here um, uh, Williams's stage directions come in and um, see Tom had already gotten up from the table and he um, had gone to a corner to stand there and smoke a cigarette but the thing is Amanda continues to address Tom as though he were still sitting in that chair so practically speaking what she's doing is she's talking to a chair she's talking to a chair pretending that that is Tom and um, of course um, to Tom it does not make any difference at all um, Amanda goes on and she says my callers were gentlemen all so none of these lower middle class type people <clears throat> among my callers were some of the most prominent young planters of the Mississippi Delta now you know the Mississippi Delta um, has some of the most fertile land um, and um, Amanda Wingfield says that her suitors the people who wanted to marry her um, they most of them uh, owned their own plantations they were not the kind of people who would have a salary or who would have a job they had a lot of money and they not only had a lot of money they also had a lot of property um, so when you reach this point in time Tom motions for music and a spot of light on Amanda her eyes lift her face glows her voice becomes rich and elegiac so as she recalls her past and especially one particular Sunday in the Blue Mountain um, her voice rises until um, it encompasses the entire area and um, you see her um, as, um, as, as a happy individual um, so when um, Amanda um, finishes making this speech um, Tennessee Williams um, has that legend again which shows where are the snows of yesteryear and um, that of course again is an indication that this is a character who lives in the past and not really um, in the present so you know her face glows and she sort of takes on an ethereal beauty because now she's going into the past and she's going to bring in all the different aspects of the past um, that she loved so then she starts to relate um, the names and the qualification of uh, her suitors or 
uh, as she calls them, gentlemen callers. There was young Champ Lawlin, who later became vice president of the Delta Planters Bank. Now she's trying to emphasize um, the fact that she has not always been as poor as she is now. Uh, and so she gives the reference of these men who, um, who came uh, with their marriage proposals. Um, and um, the first one, um, he say, uh, William says, later became vice president of the Delta Planters Bank. Um, and then um, he mentions another uh, suitor or another gentleman caller by the name of Hadley Stevenson. Uh, who, Amanda says, um, drowned in Moon Lake and left his widow 150,000 in government bonds. So throughout it all, she's trying to um, establish her sound financial uh, background uh, without, um, without her children uh, trying to sort of uh, cut her down to size without her children being sarcastic about it. So she goes on and with the list and she says that there were the Couture brothers, there were Wesley and Bates, and now these were um, the Couture brothers. Um, and of, uh, of these two, uh, Bates was um, what gave her extra special attention. He got in a quarrel with that wild Wainwright boy. They shot it out on the floor of Moon Lake Casino. Bates was shot through the stomach. He died in the ambulance on his way to Memphis. So what she's trying to do is establish um, her sound financial background um, at the same time avoiding or ignoring the present um, circumstances. So she's telling details about all these men and throughout it all she's trying to um, project her own self, trying to emphasize uh, again and again that she was not always this poor, that there was a point in time when she had a lot of money, she, um, they had her uh, own house, um, and she was a woman of importance. So um, she tells us about these different men uh, and coincidentally uh, some of these men have died since the time that they came calling on uh, Amanda. Now that sort of makes you think that perhaps those men never existed and that if they do exist, they exist only in Amanda's imagination because she keeps on saying, you know, he left the widow so much land or he left the widow so much money. So she's obsessed with that. She's obsessed with the fact that they need money but that they don't have money. So in everything she gauges uh, with reference to how much money or how much um, property an individual um, has. And of course, uh, she's trying to give her own morale a boost by telling her children that there was a time when she was beautiful and when she was very much appreciated. She was appreciated to the extent um, that um, she says uh, one of them carried her picture with her until the day he died. It was then that that picture was um, taken from him. So um, these are some of the uh, gentlemen callers that um, she uh, mentions. And of course, um, she mentions others. But while they're having this um, uh, sort of one-sided conversation, Tom chips in with his um, two penny worth of discussion and he says um, what did Fitzhugh leave his widow you know because he's been hearing uh, about um, so and so uh, he was very handsome and he was in love with me he died and he left his widow so when he tells two such stories 
Tom assumes that the third one will also have left something for his widow. And so he says, what did he leave his widow? And that makes Amanda angry and she says, he never married. Gracious, you talk as though all of my old admirers had turned up their toes to the daisies. So you talking as if all of them are dead and therefore by uh, reference I should also be, um, be dead. And um, Amanda um, becomes um, sort of belligerent and he says, what do you mean by what did he leave his widow? Are you trying to say that all those men who wanted to marry me are no longer alive? Uh, because if that is the case, I can um, disappoint you. And, um, and so um, Tom sort of takes that discussion further and um, he says, uh, isn't it the first one you've mentioned that still survives? And Amanda says, uh, totally ignoring uh, Tom, she says, that Fitzhugh boy went north and made a fortune. Came to be known as the, Waltz, the wolf of Wall Street. And the great thing is that he had the Midas touch that is, he could turn everything to gold. It wasn't just that he was rich. It was that he could make money out of nothing. And um, just for a moment, Amanda thinks, I could have been Mrs. Duncan J. Fitzhugh, but I picked your father. Of course, the Midas touch refers to um, the story of King Midas. You know, he... Um, he was in love with his gold and um, he wanted um, everything around him to be turned to gold. So he was given this power um, that everything uh, and anything that he touched would turn to gold. Um, but the story um, did not have a happy ending because um, it came to such a point that uh, King Midas could not eat anything since all the food would turn to gold as soon as it touched his body and um, his only daughter turns to gold um, so she's not a daughter anymore you know she's there but he can't um, talk with her, um, he cannot tell her how much he loves her or how sorry he is. Um, but the reference here, of course, is only to the fact that uh, he was a very wealthy person. And uh, Mrs. Am Mrs. Amanda Wingfield is not a wealthy person. So she says, you know, he was so much in love with me and he wanted to marry me and I could have been Mrs. Duncan J. Fitzhugh. Uh, but look at the sacrifices that I've made. I married your father. You know, he was not at all in the same category as the other gentlemen callers. And yet, I married him. So the greatness of Amanda Wingfield is in the fact that um, she marries um, so far beneath her status. Um, now the children have heard these stories over and over again. So when she gets to this point, Laura says, Mother, let me clear the table. And um, Amanda says, no, dear, you go in front and study your typewriter chart or practice your shorthand a little. Stay fresh and pretty. It's almost time for our gentlemen callers to start arriving. How many do you suppose you're going to entertain this afternoon? Now, this is the kind of question that could have been asked, um, let's say, 30, 35 years before the play was written. Um, and it's a reference to, again, to Amanda Wingfield's youth. It's not a reference um, to Laura Wingfield. Um, it's what, what she's actually trying to do is to make a comparison of her daughter's situation with her own, with the difference that her situation was very different because she was a very popular girl and all the men um, in the vicinity wanted to marry her. So um, she says, you know, you go and um, study your uh, typewriter chart or you go and practice your shorthand. Um, now these are two things that um, she's forcing Laura to study. 
so that Laura can take up a job and help support the family. Now, the, one of the reasons why I keep on saying that Amanda um, behaves like a young girl um, is because um, that's how Williams shows her. Even in this scene, um, she doesn't act like a middle-aged woman. You know, she's um, the mother of two grown-up children, children who are at the age where they should be getting married. And yet she behaves like a little girl and, you know, she flounces out of the kitchenette and she wears these um, very uh, frilly and lacy dresses. Not at all the kind of things that you would expect of a middle-aged woman. But that's what um, Amanda Wingfield is like and that's what her conversation is like. So she wants her daughter to go and um, sit in the living room and not do anything which would make her perspire, which would make her dress dirty um, because, you know, she has to look her best. So a kind of uh, a doll um, is, is what uh, Laura Wingfield has um, to look like. And this, of course, sort of breaks um, Tom Wingfield's patience. He throws down the newspaper and he jumps up um, and Laura, um, who is alone in the dining room, she says, I don't believe you're going to receive any gentleman caller's mother. Now Laura is trying to make her mother realize that her situation is not like that of her mother's. She can in nowhere compare with her mother. But Mrs. Wingfield is bent on making this comparison even though it shows her own daughter in a very poor light. But so obsessed is she with the past um, that she even sacrifices her daughter's feelings and she says, um, you know, how many gentlemen callers are we receiving this afternoon? And Laura says, I'm not expecting any. What are you talking about? How many? So. Uh, a big difference in um, the approach of uh, Laura and her mother um, towards life. So Amanda says, what? Not one? No one? You must be joking. So you know she pretends that she doesn't believe Laura. Her daughter um, cannot be in a situation where there are no gentlemen callers. Laura, of course, um, is very nervous and um, she just slips through the half-open curtains. Uh, and as she is slipping away, a very clear uh, shaft of light is thrown on her face and that shows her uh, against the faded tapestry of the curtains and um, you know it, it shows um, what Laura is actually like. It, um, it's also a reflection on um, the financial and social condition of the Wingfields because this curtain is faded, it's worn and against this curtain um, that is uh, worn and faded, you have the face of Laura. Now she has a, a fresh face, but she's getting on in years. She's no longer um, as young as she used to be. So it's as if that faded curtain is complemented by the faded face. Um, that we see in front of um, the curtain. And of course, this is the time when, according to Williams' stage directions, the music starts. And this is the music um, of the play um, or the, the, the theme music of the Glass Menagerie. And um, throughout it all, Amanda Wingfield continues her conversation and she says, you know, I can't believe that there are no gentlemen callers. There must be a flood. There must have been a tornado. There must have been a lot of um, gentlemen callers coming in. And Laura says, it isn't a flood. It's not a tornado, mother. I'm just not popular like you were in Blue Mountain. And of course, the moment that she utters the words Blue Mountain, Tom says, oh God. 
he is sick to death of um, the name of the blue mountain now you see that the the thing here is that um, Amanda Wingfield continues to talk about um, her youth she makes references to the blue mountain she makes references to the wealth that her uh, parents possessed but um, the fact of the matter is that neither Laura nor Tom has actually seen the Blue Mountain or witnessed that wealth. When they were born, what they saw was something very close to poverty. They did not see any of the riches. They did not see uh, much of the power that Amanda's family enjoyed according to her. So whatever she says is like a story for them. It does not have any value other than the value of a story. Because if they had witnessed it, then they would be able to say that yes, our mother came from a very rich and established family and now she has been reduced to doing her own work um, and waiting for uh, pennies and dollars to come into the house or to come into her possession so that she can go and buy some of the things um, that she needs. So Laura says it's not a flood, it's not a tornado. The thing is I am just not as popular as you were in the Blue Mountain. So Laura sort of admits um, that whatever her mother is saying is true or you can put it another way and say that Laura doesn't doubt what um, whatever her mother says whereas Tom doesn't believe it and Tom is the kind of person who's going to make um, sarcastic remarks um, and the one fear that Mrs. Wingfield has is that Laura is going to be an old maid and no man would want to marry Laura. So um, Laura, you know, is willing to face this reality and she says, I'm afraid, mother, I'm going to be an old maid. And with this, the scene sort of dims out with the legend, the glass menagerie. Um, and um, on the dark stage, the screen is lighted with the image of blue roses. So there is a continuation of action instead of one scene coming to an end and the next starting with a whole new um, stage set. What Williams has done is that um, his actors move off and on to the stage. Um, the curtain does not come down. It's not that one scene comes to an end and another scene starts. This is fluidity. This is um, movement um, and constant movement. So when we next see uh, Laura, she is seated in the delicate ivory chair, um, chair at the small claw foot table. So even the furniture that they have is a reflection of um, a social class to which they don't actually belong. You know, she has this um, few items of furniture that she says um, she has kept from um, from from the um, from her father's household. So we we see Laura sitting in one such chair, uh, and William says that she was wearing a dress of a soft velvet material, and. Um, her hair is loose uh, and she is looking very, very um, pretty. And what is she doing? She is washing and polishing her collection of glass. So this is where we come to the glass menagerie. Now, um, when we see Laura washing and polishing these glass objects or animals it's a very powerful scene um, because this is what she likes to do all the time she's not interested 
um, in going out because you need money for that. So the, she has this collection and she spends her time polishing it up. Amanda appears on the fire escape steps. At the sound of her ascent, Laura catches her breath, thrusts the bowl of ornaments away and seats herself stiffly before the diagram of the typewriter keyboard as though it held her spellbound. Remember, uh, Amanda has told her to go and study the chart. Now, Laura doesn't want to do that. She would rather spend her whole life washing and cleaning um, those little animals. But when she sees her mother coming into the house, um, she at once gets up from where she's sitting and goes and sits at um, the, um, what do you call it, um, she sits in front of the typewriter chart and she just looks at it like she's spellbound, like that's the most interesting thing um, that she can um, think of. Something has happened to Amanda. It is written in her face as she climbs to the landing, a look that is grim and hopeless and a little absurd. She has on one of those cheap or imitation velvety looking cloth coats with imitation fur collar. Her hat is five or six years old. One of those um, dreadful cloche hats that were worn in the late 20s. And she's holding an enormous black patent leather pocketbook with nickel clasps and initials. This is her full dress outfit the one she usually wears to the DAR. Before entering, she looks through the door, purses her lips, opens her eyes very wide, rolls them up, and shakes her head. And this is where we're going to stop. So um, Mrs. Amanda Wingfield enters um, the, um, the apartment she sees Laura sitting before the typewriter chart and um, Tennessee Williams describes Mrs. Wingfield with a lot of love and attention to detail. So um, she is holding um, a, a big uh, handbag which is called a pocket book. Uh, of course, it doesn't fit into your pocket. It's like a handbag. Um, and um, this is how she's dressed when she goes to um, the meeting of the DAR. And the DAR, you know, stands for Daughters of the American Revolution. So uh, Amanda Wingfield is very, very proud of her position in society. Of course, she doesn't let on to anyone um, her financial condition because she still claims to be um, the daughter of such and such a family um, uh, and she does not <clears throat> tell anyone that her um, financial condition is so bad um, that she cannot afford many of the things that uh, women richer than her um, can do it. Um, and so when she sees uh, Laura sitting uh, before the, um, um, the, the typewriter chart, um, she reacts to that. Laura is scared of her and when she sees her coming into the house, she at once goes and sits in front of the chart because that is what she's been told to do. Um, so what Williams is trying to say here is that Laura doesn't have a mind of her own. And she is very much under the thumb of Mrs. Wingfield. So like I said, we're going to stop here, but let me quickly run through what we've done today um, so that um, you know uh, very, very well what we, um, the, the point at which we are stopping today. So the play starts with um, Tom acting as a narrator and very soon uh, Mrs. Amanda Wingfield adds him to their group which consists of Amanda, her daughter Laura 
and um, she sort of um, goes back into the past she's feeling very nostalgic and she um, keeps on remembering um, the time before she got married when she was a very popular um, belle of um, the, the, the area and the, a lot of people wanted to marry her. She was not only beautiful but she was also well connected. She came from a family which was very well established. Um, but the thing is now the financial condition is so bad that they cannot have anything of what they had then and that includes the gentleman callers, the people who were interested in marrying the daughter of the house. Now she has a daughter but they don't receive any gentleman callers. There are no people, no men who are willing to marry her daughter. And that's something that um, upsets her to the point of obsession. So whatever she says, whatever she does is um, with this idea in her mind. And the idea is that her daughter has to get married. Her daughter has to get married to someone um, who is well established um, and she never lets anyone forget that she married beneath her status because when she describes this one, after, one Sunday afternoon in Blue Mountain um, she says that at one time there were 17 young men who wanted to marry her and all of these men uh, or boys um, were very rich what she's trying to imply and what she's trying to say is that she could have been one of those rich women. But she chose Mr. Wingfield. And so that is where um, the whole sort of uh, financial slide uh, starts for uh, Amanda Wingfield. Before that she'd been sitting secured in her father's house but once she gets married and her husband leaves her um, her circumstances deteriorate very fast. Uh, of course she holds Tom responsible for a lot of things. She um, holds her uh, husband responsible for everything um, and she will not let anyone uh, forget that her husband spoiled her life and now her son is also trying to do that. So she comes out as a big snob, as um, a person who is living in the past and who would like to bring the past back um, to the present um, in the form of memories. This is, as William stated at the very beginning, a memory play. So it doesn't have to be um, factual. There's a lot um, that Williams is playing around with. There's um, ideas that he introduces. There's a screen that he has put up on the stage. And on that screen you have either a legend or you have some, something that, that describes either the action that is being presented on the stage or something that is in the past, something that Williams wants um, the readers or um, the audience to remember. It, it's like a clue that he gives to his audience um, and uh, his readers. So um, we've, we've been able to do it up to this point and I'd like to leave here uh, with the assurance that you are going to read the text in the background that I have given you. Um, and I know that you're a very hardworking student, so you will have no problem doing that. So take care and Allah Hafiz.